First of all, I promise to be short. I know that you must be very tired. But uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to be here. And more than that, to congratulate them for putting together such useful conference we are having today. I would also thank Professor Luis for your words this morning. And I hope after this presentation, you still stick to them. <laughs> OK, uh, when I was invited by the organizers to join you here this evening, my first reaction was to say, no, no way. Why? It's not because I don't like them. I like them a lot. But the problem is that uh, I had decided to wear a sort of a virtual gag in 2018 and 2019 and giving priority to the fact that I have two ears and one mouth. And I thought that I should hear more and less and, and speak less. But uh, it was a, a private commitment with myself, and I said, so uh, I can perhaps breach my commitment and I'll not be frustrated because they told me they have an audience consistent of practitioners and students. And at my age, and at this point, I think I have the obligation, and which is a pleasure, such obligation to share my experience with you. Of course, Carmona has just said I'm old fashioned, emotional intelligence, and uh, I am sure that uh, when uh, AI becomes a reality, I'll no longer be uh, an arbitrator. I'll, uh, I'll be alive, but not an arbitrator. Okay. Uh, when uh, I was giving thoughts what to tell you this evening, I thought it would be useful, perhaps as a, an exercise is very Cartesian, but uh, I have had a, a strong French influence in my formation. I decided perhaps I can pick up at random, certain words, and uh, throw them and share with you those words, and at the same time, try to reconcile those words and my thoughts based on my experience, so that at the second part, then comes the Cartesian nature of this presentation, I would give you some advice. OK, uh, I have to make a strong disclaimer. I'm not an academic. I have no LLM. And in my uh, background, I have made a choice in the past, after working many years as a litigator, that I would join the corporate side of a law firm. So uh, I found it absolutely necessary to have the proper background to understand my clients and to share their concerns. So uh, I took a, an MBA here in Europe, in France. So uh, that's my background. I have no LLM. I'm not an academic and do not expect from me any theories this evening. The words I have pick it up at random are users, confidentiality, transparency, cross-examination, efficiency, time, cost, documents, construction, frivolity, and nightmare. Perhaps it may sound a bit awkward uh, this list of words, but I'll try to use them and so that they make sense to you. Let's take users. My task is uh, very easy now since after many, many years I was really 
glad to see this morning, and once again congratulations to the organizers, to see a slot created for users, the parties. That, that I, was, I was surprised, because this is something which is missing for a long time. We discuss the arbitrator, council, experts, and the parties. We never talk about the parties. And this morning we had the opportunity to hear what they had to say. And uh, I would like to underscore something which is very important. If you take the surveys prepared by many institutions, but primarily by Queen Mary and White and Case, you'll see that they are sending smoke signals to us. They have their comments. You see, if you analyze, you go deeply on the different proportions that they indicate for certain uh, requirements that they would like to see and they don't, you understand that the signals are there. But we do not may pay too much attention to users in our conferences. And that's what really uh, great to see them. And you've heard what they said. You've heard what they said. They talk about costs. They talk about efficiency. They gave us what they think are the main characteristics of an arbitrator. Carl Hennessy was very clear. He said, when I am selecting an arbitrator, I'm looking to his courage to decide. He was very clear. And I think he's right. And this reminds me uh, something that uh, Pierre Lalive used to say, a wise Pierre Lalive. And he said, the arbitrator has to be courageous enough to displease. That's what the users are looking to. That's what Carl Hennessy told us this morning. So uh, I think from the user's standpoint, what I can tell you, if it's not an advice, but uh, some words, would be let's pay attention to the smoke signals that are in the air, that they are sending to us, and we should not disregard those. The second word is confidentiality. Uh, what I can tell you about confidentiality, I remember when I started dealing with arbitration many, many years ago. Uh, from the top of your mind, what are the three main uh, advantages of arbitration? Expertise of the arbitrators, confidentiality, and speed. Are those three characteristics still uh, in place? Are, are they still important? Can, from the top of our minds, can we say that they are there, that nothing has changed? Let's try to look one to one. Speed. And we'll talk about that together with efficiency. Secondly, the expertise of the arbitrators, yes, that's true. That's one of the advantages. But are we using properly the expertise of the arbitrators we select in our day to day? And third, confidentiality. I would say that is a wishful thinking. Uh, we tend, uh, we tend to say that confidentiality no longer exists. In very, very few cases. If you see more and more, I remember eight years ago, Julian Liu and I were discussing confidentiality at the ICC Institute in Paris. And uh, he told a story 
that he had been appointed as arbitrator in a case that was so confidential, so secret, that he didn't know where to decide and to deliberate. And he said, you know what happened? We issued the award, and the next day was published by GAR. And uh, I think uh, we have good reasons to think about the public day-to-day -day of the arbitration. Take, for example, we have a, uh, a, something happening in Brazil at this point as a result of the car wash operation, which is a sort of a quote-unquote, but a similar to class arbitrations against Petrobras by instituted by minority shareholders from all over the world. One of them has over as uh, claimants uh, 1,400 funds and uh, minority shareholders, primarily funds. Can you imagine a class arbitration with 1,400 claimants to be confidential? No, of course not. It may not be confidential. One of the basic principles of the Brazilian corporations law is equal treatment of shareholders. As well it is one of the principles in the Brazilian Arbitration Act, equal treatment of the parties. So my question is, does confidentiality still exist? I can give you more examples. We are living more and more in a world where you, we have model contracts. FIDIC, AIPN for oil and gas, the traditional banking contracts for M&A. Those, those I would certainly call the pressure groups. Those are pressure groups that are interested to know what is going on how arbitral tribunals are interpreting and construing the, the clauses that are in their model contracts. And more and more, state and state-owned companies. On the one hand, and on the other hand, listed companies. I think uh, confidentiality is something that will not, never ever be recognized by AI, as it's not being recognized these days, and the importance is reduce it. But this is related to transparency. I would invite you to take a look on the Mauritius Convention on Transparency, applicable to ISDS, cases, as well as UNCITRAL rules applicable to ISDS arbitrations. Just take a look, read them, and you realize, although they were designed to be applicable to investment state dispute systems, there is a rationale behind those rules that may be also applicable to those cases of state-to-state -state owned companies, listed companies, and those cases of pressure groups. Let's talk about efficiency. I think, and this was mentioned several times today, efficiency is related at the same time to time and cost. We heard external in-house counsel telling us today, if they want to work on a basis of uh, success fees, hourly basis, the terms of the caps, uh, no caps, and so on and whatnot. But I have a question. Why have we added too much complexity 
to arbitration, to complex arbitrations. It became extremely complex. And at the same time, I ask you a question, why expedited procedures are so successful? ICC, recently, see the numbers, see the results of the expedited procedures. In cases where the amount in dispute is far, far above the limit established by the rules. I've heard, I don't know the details, but I've heard that recently has been issued an award under expedited procedures pursuant to ICC rules in an amount in dispute of $140 million. Why? I remember, and uh, my dear friend Wendy certainly has the same recollection, when this discussion about expedited procedures was put to us by Alexis in, uh, in our Bureau of Vice Presidents, I immediately told, I'm in agreement, I think it's very important, but more than that, I think that the practice of the expedited procedures will give us the reasons for us to take a look, look backwards, and see why arbitrations became so complex, so expensive. And I would say where speed is not a main feature. I, I would say that uh, there's the reasons we can allocate them to the parties, to the arbitrators, uh, in different proportions. But I, I would like to, to give you my sense. But I'll do that asking questions. Why are submissions that long? That's the first question. Examples. I did get, in the last three weeks, one statement of defense with 800 pages. I did get a reply with 500 pages. I'll tell you what uh, I have decided to do uh, more recently in my cases. I said, look, I will not limit. Of course, I will invite you not to uh, file submissions over uh, 200 pages. But if you do, please add an executive summary <laughs> so that we can read what you intend to convey to us. Because when you read that, you see they are repetitive. The, especially in cases of civil law countries, the abuse of adjectives and adverbs, which are not necessary. If you say, it rained a lot, or if you say it rained, it is the same. If you say that's lack of good faith, why say an unbearable lack of good, of good faith? It's the same. And uh, I think that's for primarily for the students. I do not understand why we missed the opportunity to convey to the arbitrators, which is a special moment, your thoughts. Give them the opportunity to understand which is your case, which your case is. Use that opportunity extensively, but not using 800 pages or 500 pages. 
Uh, I remember years and years ago, I did get a, a book from a good friend of mine in London. He said, look, that's very important for you. Since you are a lawyer, I'll give you this book. I'm sure you'll appreciate it. And you'll take those lessons into account. This book was written in 1954, last century, by Sir Ernest Gowes. And this book is called Plain Words. And if I could give you the students, future counsel, and future young arbitrators, an advice I will borrow from him. He simply says at the very end of his book, so be short, be simple, be human. That was his advice. So uh, I think we, we have to take a look and uh, something that irritates the arbitrators, in addition to the 800 or 500 pages, you have long texts, you're addressing your case, you're addressing your reason, and all of a sudden, you cut everything and you insert a citation in the text. I read the citation, I'm there to read. And then I have to go back to the reasoning, and this means that I have to go back to the page before the citation. You can use the footnotes, for sure. They are there for that. But don't abuse your footnotes. I'll, tell, I'll give you an example. Uh, I did get a, uh, one case submissions that uh, three quarters of the page were footnotes. And there's very few text. But uh, I, I think we have to take care. Uh, we have to take advantage of this opportunity to convey our thoughts and our case. And do not forget, those who will be reading and deciding your case, they know what you mean because they have the expertise or theoretically they should have because you had the opportunity to to select your arbitrator. If you made a mistake, sorry, next time be, uh, be right and choose the right person. But that's why, and you don't need to repeat, repeat and repeat the same thing because we read them. I can tell you, arbitrators read the submissions as I read the 800 page submission I did get. So, uh, if you have any difficulties in organizing your ideas, I think it's very important when you get your case, you take a look on the facts, on the claims that you can post, the relief you seek, and we're gonna try to organize a risk matrix and see what are your good arguments, how you can get out of that case in the very end decided by the arbitrators. And from that point onwards, develop your strategy and always go back. And more, more important, I think, keep this strategy in place throughout the proceedings. Avoid changing your arguments uh, from, time, from one submission to the other because you create a problem for the, your opposing party who cannot exercise fully the defense because you keep on changing and not always, and that's part of the problem, the arbitrators will take the decision and will take the position suggested by Pierre Lalive. I think and I am convinced that, for instance, in the case of the due process, I certainly subscribe to what Bernardo Gramari said. There is, we have to have a clear line separating due process from due process paranoia. And sometimes 
you are accepting to uh, be led by this paranoia and with uh, submissions that say this is uh, a violation of the principles and all the in the end comes up to the mind, oh, they will try to, to set aside the word. But if you don't take a decision and, and say, look, that's enough. Because this may be an endless process. With submissions after submissions, one responding to the other, there is a cutoff date, enough. And even if, uh, the parties, one of the parties or both parties can say that you are breaching the due process. I can tell you, be courageous enough and move on because it's better that you make a decision instead of being intimidated by the parties and uh, possible actions to set aside. Uh, another comment I would like to, to make, I think it's important, is uh, it's more for civil country, uh, civil law countries and from continental Europe and Latin America, is cross-examination. I think uh, cross-examination is not in our genesis as lawyers. We are not trained to, uh, to cross-examination. So do not try to copy what common law lawyers can do easily. It's marvelous. I love certain I, I love to see how the cross-examination is developed by common lawyers. But I hate to see civil lawyers trying to follow that same route, which in the end is something absolutely fake. A disaster. So, cross-examination, if you have to conduct a cross-examination, prepare your questions. Ask your questions. As you feel you have to. And don't take example from those that have a different formation from you. Of course, I, I'm not amongst those who believe that there is a strong uh, difference between civil law and common law? Of course not. I think the, the route may be different, but the outcome is the same, because law is common sense. But uh, before I finish, I, I would like to take some important points. I mentioned one of the words was frivolity. I am tired after six years, I'll tell you, sitting as vice president of ICC court of reporting and deciding on challenges and objections to arbitrators based on frivolous arguments. Of course, if you have good reasons to challenge or to bring an objection to the appointment of an arbitrator, of course you have to do. But this may not be a strategy. This may not be our day to day. I think those who have dealt with challenges and objections in uh, LCIA, ICC, will understand what I mean. Exercise your rights, but take care. That may, those may be against you. Two final comments and my concerns. Construction arbitration. We have many, many cases of construction arbitration going on, about to come, and this has always been the trend in international arbitration. And this has been mentioned here during the panel. In the case of oil and gas, infrastructure, concessions, public-private 
uh, partnerships, the PPPs based on the UK model. But uh, I, I tell you frankly, I don't know what will be the future of construction arbitration. If we don't find a way to solve the problems, it will become unbearable. I give you examples, recent cases. I had one of them with a small case compared to others that I've heard that we had to decide 158 claims ranging from $300 to $12 million. How do you settle that? And I can tell you that uh, and the smallest claims took more time for counsel to explain those to us. We, we have to find a way. We have the ways and means to settle that. We have to preserve arbitration in construction projects and disputes. Those disputes have to be settled. And arbitration is by far the best way to do that. But we have other instruments that may reduce the scope of arbitration as we have today. Some colleagues sitting as arbitrators told me they had 500 claims to be decided. Which means that if you have 158, which was my case of 500, you'll have 158 arbitrations and 500 arbitrations in one. That's why dispute boards are so important. Dispute boards may clean up the area and at the end the arbitration will focus on the very significant points. And uh, there is a good example, I think, it's public, was mentioned in, in many conferences, the, the Panama Channel construction, the, the expansion. Most of the claims were decided by dispute boards. We have dispute boards in Brazil in some contracts. Uh, for the subway system uh, of Sao Paulo, because that, were, that was financed by the World Bank and IFC, and they required arbitration and dispute board. What happened? The dispute board decisions were made. They challenged all of them, and they went into arbitration. So uh, if you do not comply, you are not prepared to accept the decisions by the dispute board, it's useless. I tell you frankly that uh, I had certain reserves with respect to mediation. Not because I don't like mediation, it's because we Brazilians especially do not have this, the culture of mediation. It's starting in family matters. Uh, recently in some business cases, but uh, I tell you frankly, I think mediation may be extremely useful to help to solve the construction arbitration uh, problems and preserve the future. I am afraid that the good arbitrators who are extremely experienced in construction We'll get to a point we'll not accept appointments to the side cases like those of 200, 500 claims. Okay, the last point, which is also important and is related to nightmare. I, I told you the last word I used, I pick it up, was nightmare and relates to document production. This is something that became really a nightmare. A nightmare. Uh, once uh, we were in Milan, I met 
Alan Redfern, and I asked him, look, Alan, may I ask you a question? Of course. When you designed the schedule, had you ever imagined that arbitrators could get Redfern schedules amounting to 700 pages? He said, never, ever. That's what's going on. Eric Schwartz told me the other day that he received something like uh, 900 pages in total from both sides. The point is, either you have a case or you have not. Because you have submitted the statement of claim. The, the opposing party has submitted the statement of defense. And you came to us, you come to us to to ask to have access to documents that amount to 400 pages. Something is going wrong. And uh, I think many of you here sitting as arbitrators, in many cases, or even counsel, you know how hard it is for arbitrators to decide. Unless it is, the request is overly broad, it's overly broad, it's easy to decide. But many other cases, should I grant, should I deny? It takes a while until you decide, the members of the tribunal decide. I, another thing I'm doing is when we establish the provisional timetables and counsel tell them, look, we'll submit the reference and then you have one week to decide. No way. No way. I need more time. Because what I know, either we take a reasonable time or the next event will be delayed. Because we have to make a decision. We try to be cooperative with counsel, with the parties, for them to have access to documents. But it's impossible. And uh, it, it is clear that uh, no arbitral tribunal will allow fishing expeditions. So relevance, materiality are very important. And sometimes you don't find them clearly uh, stated in the, in the red ferns, although you have the spaces. Alan designed on that. But that's where we stand. So, uh, as I told you at the beginning, my disclaimer, I am not a, an academic. I sincerely brought to you and shared with you my experience, my concerns these days. And uh, you may be asking at this point, you mentioned not to use adjectives, not to use adverbs, and you used them immensely. Before you ask me the question, I'll tell you, just do what I'll tell you to do, and don't do what I did. Thank you. <laughs>